yes, yes. perfectly okay. fine Great. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Astrid and Sarah, for inviting me uh, to these seminars. Actually, uh, it was also a discovery for me because I could see a lot of the talks uh, that are already available there, so it was really nice. And yes, yeah, Sarah mentioned, uh, I've been working in a kind of more basic research, we can say, in the past, in my PhD and postdoc. Um, and now, uh, since uh, I work in ASTI, I'm doing a very, very, very applied research, so um, completely uh, very different. And um, yeah, I'm going to tell you on how we are applying uh, evolutionary and environmental genomics to fisheries management. So first of all, uh, what is uh, fisheries management, right? Um, so fisheries management is really this uh, difficult task of maintaining this equilibrium between uh, having fish in our plates uh, without harming too much the environment and at the same time maintaining the uh, economic viability of the fishing sector. So as you can imagine, uh, keeping these uh, three vertices of this triangle uh, happy, it's not an easy task and requires uh, involvement of a lot of agents. Uh, such as fishers, governments, uh, fisher stakeholders, coastal stakeholders, and very importantly, scientists. So science is a really big pillar of the fisheries management process. And fisheries management is uh, really based on scientific advice. So from the fisheries management, um, there are several actions that derive, and maybe the most unknown ones are, for example, uh, the famous tax, so the total allowable catch, how much we can fish to keep the fishery sustainable, which fishing gears are acceptable so that our environment is not uh, too much uh, damaged, where should we be fishing, uh, which area should be avoided for fishing, uh, because maybe there is an area of uh, high abundance of juveniles or is an area of spawning and things like this, and also all the issues related with traceability. So is the fish that comes to our plate uh, really the species they tell us it is, right? So to, to avoid all the issues with illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing. So what, are the, what is the type of scientific knowledge uh, that we need in order to have and to, to, to produce uh, good fisheries management um, uh, procedures, right? So um, there is a lot of scientific knowledge we need, but, but just to give you some examples, for example, we need to know how many fish there are, what is the fish biomass uh, for a particular species. So if we don't know how much there is, how can we advise on how much we can fish, right? Also, we need to know things uh, related to reproduction. Uh, how, those, how do those fish reproduce? Uh, at what age they reach maturity? How much offspring they produce and things like this? And then obviously all that is related uh, to the interactions of this fish with the environment and the other species. So in Europe, we have the common fisheries policy, which is uh, the framework where all these actions uh, related to fisheries management uh, are, um, are uh, put together, right? So just um, as a very schematic view of the fisheries uh, management process, here you have um, more or less the way it works. So what we do is that we collect the data, it usually comes from the fisheries themselves. With this data, we do the assessment of the status of the fishery. And then once we have the status of the fishery, we can produce some scientific advice on how we, sh we think we should proceed. And then the managers, taking the scientific advice into account, but all the, also other external factors, they uh, make the management decisions, which affect obviously the fisheries. Uh, sometimes we can also make use of fishery independent data, not only data that comes with the fishery, uh, so, such as uh, data that comes, for example, from scientific surveys and so on. So what does it have to do with genomics and how can genomics uh, provide or help us uh, providing scientific information that is useful for uh, fisheries management. And this is what I will try to talk to you in this talk, how we have been using uh, population genetics, phylogenetics, and also metabarcoding of environmental DNA in order to produce data that is relevant to assist um, the fisheries assessment process and therefore the fisheries management process. 
so as a reminder, here's what we have, right? So we have the, uh, what I told you before, the, um, the, the way the fisheries uh, a management process works. Uh, what we have, we need to assess the status of a fishery. Uh, but what do we really assess? What is the unit that we are assessing? So in fisheries, the management units are called um, stocks. So one of the things, or the perhaps the most known application for uh, genomics in fisheries management is stock delimitation, stock identification. So which is the unit we should be assessing and managing? So a stock, as I said, is a management unit. So we are assuming that changes in stock dynamics are a function of intrinsic parameters, such as growth, recruitment, mortality, and fishing mortality, and that are not dependent on immigration and immigration rates. So in an ideal situation, a stock should be composed by a population, by an evolutionary significant unit, that is a group of sexually interbreeding individuals which possess a common gene pool. This is the ideal situation, but as you can imagine, uh, this mm, oftentimes it doesn't happen. So we can have cases where we can have more than one population included in the same stock, or we can have a stock that only takes uh, considers part of a population. This is important because um, fish populations, despite being from the same species, they can have different parameters. For example, I will explain you later, bluefin tuna in the Eastern and Western Atlantic, they don't reproduce the same way, they don't reach maturity at the same age, and so on. So we really need to consider the biological parameters of each population to do the assessment. And if you will mix them, we may be ending uh, producing wrong advices for fisheries management, and then uh, they will not be effective measures. So we've been working uh, since I started the NASTY uh, on applying uh, population genetics for stock identification in different species. Um, those species are assessed and managed by different bodies, such as the ICES, International Council for the Exploration of the Sea, or ICAT, International Commission for the Conservation of Atlantic Tunas, or IOTC, Indian Ocean Tuna Commission. So I don't have time, of course, to tell you about all of them. So I have picked three examples that I think illustrate quite well the type of information uh, we can get uh, with this type of analysis that is relevant for fisheries management. So those are the big eye tuna, the white anglerfish, and the bluefin tuna. And each of them is assessed and managed by a different uh, body. So starting with the big eye tuna, um, this is a species that is a tropical tuna, uh, so inhabits uh, different oceans, but here the study uh, I'm going to be focusing on is a study about the Indian Ocean. So well, we were commissioned to study uh, by the IOTC to see if the Indian, Indian Ocean um, big eye tuna population was actually one population more or what was going on. So the big eye tuna in the Indian Ocean is assessed as one stock. So we did, this is the samples we collected. So we collected samples in different locations and also at different ages, adults, juveniles, and young of the year. And uh, what we obtain is that clearly uh, there is a separation uh, per ocean. So we can see the Atlantic Ocean is very differentiated from the rest of the samples. And we can also see differentiation between the Indian and the Pacific Ocean. In the Pacific Ocean, uh, in the Indian Ocean, sorry, you can see that there is um, what we could call a pet mixture. So it's uh, completely, uh, we cannot really distinguish any subpopulations here. So this means that we are in a Nisi situation where uh, in this case, one stock would equal one population. This result has been communicated to IOTC. And actually this is an easy and nice case where uh, they are quite happy because they can continue doing the assessment and the management of the big eye tuna the way they have been doing it in the past because uh, there is no incongruence between stock and population. Uh, as you can imagine, this is rare. Uh, I just wanted to tell you this to, to introduce this example, but uh, you will see from the two examples I will show you uh, in the following slides that uh, this is not, uh, I mean, different, many different situations can occur. Okay, the following example, uh, it's the white anglerfish. 
So the white anglerfish, um, it's also a very valuable uh, species. Um, it is a species that inhabits the Northeast Atlantic and it coexists with its sister species, which is the black anglerfish. Those both species are very similar. Uh, only really experts can distinguish them uh, just by looking at them. But um, the, the uh, let's say diagnostic character for their identification, species identification, is the color of the peritoneum, which is this uh, little epithelium that covers the stomach. Uh, in the black anglerfish, it is black, and in the white anglerfish, it is white. So this is the way we usually distinguish them. Their distribution is a little bit different. So the black anglerfish uh, has a more southern distribution and the white anglerfish a more northern distribution. And also they inhabit different depths. So the white anglerfish lives more in a deeper waters and the black anglerfish lives in shallower waters. So we did this study focusing mostly on the white anglerfish. So uh, we really wanted to see if the three stocks that are used to assess and manage the white anglerfish in the Northeast Atlantic, the Northern platform, the Northern and the Southern stocks, if this separation into three stocks had any uh, biological sense. Uh, so if we really had three populations or what was going on here. We also had some samples from the Mediterranean to, to use them as an outgroup and just for methodological um, checking purposes. And also we had some samples from black anglerfish from the same reasons. So as you can see here, we had a strong, uh, strange uh, principal component analysis results. So here each color represents one of the three stocks, remind you here. So we have, uh, well, these colors don't correspond, sorry, but there are three colors, right? So three colors, one is one of the stocks. As you can see, we have three, clearly distinguished groups. So you, you cannot see here, but there are many, many, many dots, one on top of the other here, same here and same here. And then we only have five samples that are uh, outside uh, those three groups. So we'll go in detail. Uh, this, uh, well, I didn't mention, but this uh, also in the case of the uh, big eye tuna, we were using SNPs. Uh, and in the big eye tuna, we, we identify them using DART sequencing. Here, this is rat sequencing. So this is the number of SNPs uh, that we have been using. So in this group, we got all, all the samples that fall into these groups are actually uh, white anglerfish. So they have a white peritoneum. All the samples that fall into this middle group and also these uh, isolated samples here are also white anglerfish. However, the samples that fall into this group are the white anglerfish and the black anglerfish. So we included black anglerfish in this analysis. And as you can see, they fall into this group to have together with some uh, white anglerfish. So there is an assay that uh, was uh, developed for white and black anglerfish species identification based on mitochondrial DNA. Uh, this is was because of these issues I told you that those species are very similar. So um, some uh, researchers developed this assay based on mitochondrial uh, DNA. So if we apply this assay to these samples, we can see that all the samples in this group have actually white mitochondrial DNA. All these samples here have black mitochondrial DNA despite some of them having white peritoneum. And from the samples here, some have white mitochondrial DNA and some have black mitochondrial DNA. So what is going on here? So first of all, we have a species identification issue. So clearly those individuals are all black anglerfish. This is uh, shown by nuclear markers and mitochondrial markers. So it seems that there are black anglerfish with white peritoneum. So this is a big issue for management because actually they do the assessment and they identify the species based on this morphological feature. And then what is going on with the rest of the samples, right? So we assume that those are the white anglerfish, those are the black anglerfish, despite some having the uh, white peritoneum. Then those in the middle would be hybrids. And we did additional analysis to prove this. And actually we found hybrids between the two species. This was not known. So it was the first time we reported this. And we also 
uh, found back crosses. So we didn't find any F2s, but we found back crosses uh, in both sides. So another issue that is important for management that we found is the presence of hybrids. This is very important for management. Why? Because um, it is very likely that hybrids don't contribute to the offspring uh, as the pure ones. So when we do fisheries, when we do the assessment of the fishery, we count actually the uh, females in order to predict the um, uh, following year's recruits. So if we are counting hybrids as equally fertile than the pures, we would be overestimating uh, the population for the following years. And obviously we would not be taking the management actions that would be needed uh, to protect uh, these species for be from being overexploited. So this is quite important. It is very important also because they are frequent. It's not that we found some hybrids uh, sporadically and some uh, occasional hybrids. We found a large proportion of the specimens that were given to us as white anglerfish were hybrids. So you can see here in some areas, the hybrids represented here in the, with gray color are almost in some cases up to 20, 20 something percent. So it's quite high proportion of hybrids, especially here. The black uh, area correspond to those that were misidentified. So those uh, white anglerfish or anglers, anglerfish with white peritoneum that were actually black anglerfish. So you can see that this occurs more in the South and in the Mediterranean, but it occurs and it could also be a problem for the assessment. So this has been communicated to the uh, ICES, which is the body that does the assessment and management of anglerfish. And they are actually working uh, together with us because we are continuing with this study um, to see how we can integrate this information uh, into the assessment. And uh, if we, let's say, forget about these gray and black areas here, and we consider only those individuals that are actually white anglerfish, uh, and we do, uh, again, a PCA to see if the three stocks have any biological meaning, we see that actually uh, there is no genetic differentiation at all, and that anglerfish, white anglerfish throughout the Northeast Atlantic um, forms a unique genetically connected population. So again, there is a third issue, which is that we have one population that has been artificially divided into three stocks. And this could be problematic also for having good estimates in the assessment. This has also been uh, communicated to the ISIS. So what is going on with the anglerfish? This is work in progress. We are now uh, working on trying to understand a bit more what's going on. Um, we don't know if these hybrids are recent or if they have been happening in the past. Uh, if they are recent, maybe they are, we are um, witnessing uh, a phenomenon, a new phenomenon that could be uh, the merging into one species or the appearance of a new species, or maybe we are sim simply um, uh, seeing a stable hybrid zone that will continue like this uh, for years and years. What we have seen is that if we check the uh, distribution of the two species, so white anglerfish here in the top and black in the bottom, uh, it has been changing through the years. So this is from um, 1995. So uh, both species are actually moving northwards, uh, but the, uh, this movement is a little bit more pronounced in the black anglerfish. So there could be some issues with changes in the distribution of the species. So perhaps now they overlap more than before. And also there could be some issues with the changes in the uh, distribution concerning depth, but we don't know. So this is something we are now uh, trying to see uh, if we can learn more about this. Okay, another one, and this is the last example uh, on the use of population genetics for fisheries management is the bluefin tuna. So the bluefin tuna, you probably know, it's an emblematic species, very commercially important. Um, in a critical situation, it's not classified as endangered, IOCN right now, but it's critical. Uh, the situation is quite critical, especially in the West. So the bluefin tuna uh, inhabits the Atlantic Ocean, but it has a peculiarity and it's that 
it only spawns in two sites, in the two sides of the Atlantic where the conditions are appropriate. So uh, the bluefin tuna has a tropical ancestor, so it needs uh, warm conditions for spawning. So, and those warm conditions for spawning in the Atlantic are found in the Mediterranean Sea and in the Gulf of Mexico. So um, those are the two spawning grounds, although the Atlantic bluefin tuna is found um, throughout the Atlantic. In terms of management, uh, two stocks are considered divided by this um, line, which is located in the 45 West Meridian. So this means that whatever is caught uh, at the um, in the at one side at each side of the line would be considered western or eastern stock, depending on where it has been caught. However, we know that bluefin tuna can cross this line and can cross this line even several times through its uh, lifetime. So we know that a fish that has been caught here can easily be, could have easily be born uh, in the Mediterranean and the other way around. So this stock uh, delimitation line uh, could be problematic because we know that the, the tuna can cross this line several times. However, there is um, some, um, feeling, let's say, that there are actually two populations despite bluefin tuna being able to cross this line because there is a hypothesis that says that there is homing behavior in this species. Why do we think that the bluefin tuna has homing behavior? Well, the first evidence comes from tagging studies. So tagging studies have observed that actually all the tunas that have visited the Gulf of Mexico, none of them visit the Mediterranean. So once we, you have visited the Gulf of Mexico, you always come back to the Gulf of Mexico and you don't enter the Mediterranean. Same thing the other way around. So if you have visited the Mediterranean, you don't visit the Gulf of Mexico. And then there are some tunas here that I will come back to this a bit later that they haven't seen uh, to be visiting any of the spawning grounds. But what is important now is this too. So if you have visited the Gulf of Mexico, you haven't visited the Mediterranean and the other way around. And the second evidence for natal homing is the otholith microchemistry composition. So the otholiths are those ear bones that the fish have. And those ear bones accumulate chemical signatures through their lifetime. So the otholiths are actually like the, uh, like the trunks of the trees with these rings, right? So they, they are growing year and year and they form these rings. And each time they grow, they accumulate the chemicals that are present in the water this fish uh, is, is, is at that time. So if we look at the nucleus of the otholith, the, the middle of the otholith, and we analyze its chemical signature, we will get the chemical signature corresponding to its birth. So uh, in several studies, this is one of them, they have shown that actually taking adults from the Gulf of Mexico and the Mediterranean, you can see that their core of the otholith has a chemical signature that actually corresponds to either the Gulf of Mexico or Mediterranean where the fish was caught. So spawning adults were found where they were actually born, um, making, the, uh, making them suggest that actually they are coming back to where they were born, in, like in a homing behavior uh, situation. So we also did a study uh, to try to, to see if we, can, we could see a homing behavior using genetics. But most importantly, we also included in this study uh, um, samples from a new spawning ground that was discovered uh, quite recently in 2016. So in 2016, uh, they did a survey uh, and, they, and they have been doing, doing surveys since then, and they have been finding uh, bluefin tuna larvae in this area, where we didn't know before that was a spawning area for bluefin tuna. So the, um, this was uh, a little bit controversial because we didn't know actually if this spawning ground has existed in the past, but just um, we didn't find it yet or that is actually a new spawning ground that has arose uh, due to some changing conditions in the ocean or something like this. So we did this study on trying to see if we could uh, confirm the homing behavior of bluefin tuna 
uh, using genetics. So for that aim, what we did is that we collected larvae and young of the year uh, in the two spawning grounds. Why we did that? Those are considered reference samples. So if a larvae was captured here, it is impossible that it was born here. A larvae cannot travel uh, so far uh, without growing. So, um, and the same for a, a very young uh, juvenile. So those are individuals that are less than one year. So that's, we call them young of the year. So it, if we find young of the year in this area, it is, it has, to, it is born here. It is impossible that it was born on the other side of the Atlantic. So those are the samples that really represent the uh, reference population. So we did an analysis. Again, this is rat sequencing. We got about 10,000 SNPs. And as you can see, we see some degree of differentiation between both sides of the Atlantic. Here, the yellow, orange-ish dots are the Mediterranean ones and the purple ones and the Gulf of Mexico and Slope C, which is this area here. The Gulf of Mexico and the Mediterranean are more or less differentiated. The Slope C falls a little bit in between. And I will come back to this a bit later because we have more results related to the Slope C. Um, so really what we can see here is that genetic data also supports natal, ho natal homing and that stocks can then be composed by mixed population. So even though we have this natal homing behavior of coming back, that doesn't prevent uh, a bluefin tuna that was born in the Mediterranean to be caught in this side of the Atlantic and to be counted as of the Western stock. So we need a tool really to assign samples to their stock of origin. And this is what we did. Um, from the SNPs we uh, obtained, we selected those that were more discriminant and that we were, that were able to assign um, individuals to where they were born. So here you can see the result of individuals uh, that were collected in this area, so outside the spawning areas, and we were able to assign them to where they were born. As you can see, most of the individuals captured in the east were actually born in the Mediterranean, but a quite large, large proportion of the individuals born, uh, sorry, captured in the West were also born in the Mediterranean. So we see some kind of uh, expansion of the Mediterranean population towards the West more than of the Gulf of Mexico population towards the East. This is also expected because the Mediterranean population is about 10 times larger than the Gulf of Mexico population. And also I didn't mention, but I mentioned it a little bit in the beginning, it is important that we assign individuals to stocks because the Mediterranean and the, and the, and the Gulf of Mexico samples, uh, individuals have different uh, reproductive uh, characteristics, they mature at different ages and so on, and they have different what we call age length keys, that is uh, what age an individual has depending on the length and so on. So it is important that we assign catches to the stock of origin. So these genetic stock identification tools allows to assign catches to population of origin. So this was the good news. However, you can see here that we have a quite large proportion of individuals that we cannot assign to any of the stocks. So there's a lot of uh, uh, pie charts with gray areas, right? And also you could see here before, as I told you before, that this new uh, spawning ground, individuals from this new spawning ground fall a little bit in between the two populations, the Western and the Eastern population. So there's something uh, more to dig into uh, related to, to, this, to this question, right? Also, um, those individuals that could not be assigned, uh, we also checked in another study where we compare uh, genetics and otholith chemistry. So we tried to do an integrated analysis where we used the information from the genetic assignment tool and from the otholith chemistry to see if altogether uh, we could be able to do a better assignment. And actually what we saw is that there was a large proportion of individuals that had contradictory uh, origin. Uh, if we look at the otholith and if we look at the genetics, those are the individuals that fall here in the otholith microchemistry um, PCA. So those are individuals that actually fall in an otholith um, microchemistry composition which could be um, 
explained actually by another Atlantic spawning area. If we look at the, at the microchemical, at the chemical composition of the waters of the Atlantic Ocean, we see that here, um, the composition here could fall actually with the composition uh, from the slope sea. So we decided to expand our data set and to focus really on trying to understand what was going on in the slope sea. Uh, so we collected more samples, and in this case, uh, the larvae and the young of the year alone were not enough. So we also included spawning adults. So we took adults that were actually captured in the spawning areas and that were spawning. So we uh, checked uh, and they, their maturity and uh, they were spawning. So as you can see here, the results we obtained were a bit similar. So we have the Mediterranean in one side, Gulf of Mexico in the other, Slope Sea a little bit in, in the middle. However, you can see it also in the admixture plot that there are some Mediterranean-like individuals, we call them, in the Gulf of Mexico. So we, we captured actually in the Gulf of Mexico individuals that have a Mediterranean-like genetic profile. There are quite a lot and they are all adults. We didn't find this in the larvae. And also we can see that the slope C is a little bit mixed. So we see this a little bit better here where we have the distribution of the admixture profiles of the Mediterranean. As you can see, it's quite homogeneous. In the Gulf of Mexico, we have a quite homogeneous peak, but then we have this peak here with the, with the Mediterranean-like individuals. And then the slope C seems to be a little bit in between. Okay, so how is genetic differentiation maintained? Why is genetic differentiation maintained uh, if we have gene flow? So we have shown that there is gene flow. Actually also, we checked these individuals that were found in the Gulf of Mexico and that have a Mediterranean-like profile and they were spawning capable, what we call them. So they were really as if they had spawn or if they were about to spawn. So really they could be spawning there. So one of the obvious question was to check uh, markers, outlier, outlier SNPs to check uh, for potential uh, adaptation, right? How we could, you could have local adaptation that explain this. So if we do uh, the analysis using on only neutral SNPs and outlier markers, you can see with neutral SNPs, we get exactly the same picture. So it's virtually identical to the one with all markers. And if we look at potentially under um, uh, adaptive markers, you see this um, strange pattern where in the PC in the PC2 we have the separation between uh, Mediterranean and um, let's say Eastern and Western Atlantic, but we still we then have this uh, second axis or first axis in this case where the samples are divided a bit differently. Anyway, this uh, suggests that genetic differentiation cannot be explained with local adaptation, but still we wanted to explore a little bit more what those um, potentially and their selection markers uh, were saying, because this pattern was a bit um, uh, strange and we wanted to explore a bit more uh, what was going on. So basically we, we have here more or less three groups. Um, and if we check the um, frequency of uh, these two groups in the different locations, we see that, so this is the slope C, larvae and young of the year, Mediterranean larvae and young of the year, Mediterranean adults, Gulf of Mexico larvae and Gulf of Mexico adults. You can see that this form, this group, only occurs uh, in, the Mediterranean, uh, in the Mediterranean, either larvae and young of the year and adults, and then we have this intermediate that occurs everywhere, different proportions, and this one that occurs is, is, the, is the, um, the most predominant one, basically. If we check the SNPs that are responsible for this uh, separation, we can see that they are in linguist disequilibrium. Actually, they belong to two scaffolds in the reference genome, so they are linked and they are inherited together. So this could be a typical uh, situation where we could have uh, genomic inversion, right? Uh, but what's going on here? What is What does it have to do with the genetic differentiation we have and so on? So this question still uh, is unanswered. So how is genetic differentiation maintained despite gene flow? Another thing we wanted to explore to answer this question is the mitochondrial inter integration. So one of the 
potential explanation is that the genetic differentiation is maintained just because um, this uh, gene flow is a recent event. So perhaps the mitochondrial integration could give us some hints on this. Maybe you don't know, but uh, at least 5% of the bluefin tuna have uh, mitochondria introgressed from albacore tuna. Um, this is known, uh, it was reported, and actually if we do a phylogeny with the nuclear genomes, we will get a tree that looks like this. But if we do a phylogeny with mitochondrial, gene, with mitochondrial DNA, depending on which individuals of bluefin tuna we take, we will get those two species as sister species. So the tunus tinus and the tunus alalunga, bluefin tuna and albacore tuna as sister species. This uh, creates some problems with, for food traceability. Uh, and I just highlight this here to highlight the importance on, of knowing the evolutionary context of the species when we are going to do food fraud and food traceability studies, because we may think that there is fraud when there is not and the other way around if we don't know things like this. Okay, so we know that there is mitochondrial integration. This has been known, but what does it have to do with uh, this issue that we see uh, with genetic differentiation despite gene flow? Okay, so uh, one of the things that is important is that we have found uh, that the introgression is also visible at the nuclear level. So um, in some previous studies, they did some analysis of the nuclear genome in Atlantic bluefin tuna, and they concluded that there is no introgression at the nuclear level from albacore, but we see clearly an introgression. But what is important is that we see that this introgression is much higher in the uh, Mediterranean and Slope Sea than in the Gulf of Mexico. So uh, actually, the, most of the studies that were done uh, to see, uh, to study mitochondrial integration were done in the uh, Mediterranean bluefin tuna, but actually there is no integration in the Gulf of Mexico uh, bluefin tuna, which is uh, congruent with what we find at the nuclear level. If we check, this inversion I was telling you before, uh, the integration, the, um, the actually the integration is much higher in this region. As you can see, the scales here are very different, so 10, 10 times higher here. So the integration is much higher in this inversion. So the hypothesis that this is that this inversion could come from albacore. Actually, if we do a PCA only using those of like outlier SNPs and including the other species. If we, if we do it using all the SNPs, you can see that the species clusters with each other and that Atlantic and Pacific bluefin tuna cluster together because they are very, very um, closely related. But if we do it only with the outlier SNPs, we have a very different situation where we have some samples of Atlantic bluefin tuna uh, clustering with the Pacific, but the others, they, they follow the same pattern as we saw in the PCA. And it's like the albacore was uh, pushing them uh, towards it. So our hypothesis is that, is that this inversion comes from the algae. We don't know what this inversion does, and we don't know if it uh, gives some uh, selective advantages or anything. But this inversion helps us hypothesize that actually the gene flow between the Mediterranean towards the West is recent, because otherwise this inversion would have homogenized through the whole uh, range of the species. But it's more present in the Mediterranean, following to the Slope Sea and almost absent in the Gulf of Mexico. So our hypothesis is that recent unidirectional transatlantic gene flow mediated by a new mixed spawning area is really shaping the, um, the evolution of um, Atlantic bluefin tuna. This could be um, suggesting that we are facing a genetic erosion and perhaps an erasing of the Gulf of Mexico population uh, overcome by the Mediterranean population, but we don't know. This is uh, what we are studying now. Uh, we are developing more uh, genetic tools. We are developing more SNP uh, chips, and we are doing uh, low coverage whole genome sequencing, and we are doing uh, more analysis to try to understand this part. For the moment, we have communicated this to ICAT uh, to, um, so that they, they are taking it into account for the management. And then very briefly, I want to tell you a little bit about how we are using environmental DNA in the context of fisheries management. You all know what is barcoding and metabarcoding, but you also know probably that now we can apply metabarcoding to environmental DNA. 
So basically environmental DNA is uh, this DNA that we collect from the environment without isolating the organisms themselves. So how can this help uh, fisheries management? So we have been using it in a pipelagic and deep ocean. I told you before then that in the common fisheries policy, we can also make use of fishery independent data. This fishery independent data usually come from uh, scientific surveys. The scientific surveys are very are costly, are selective. They are unable to detect rare and elusive species and they are habitat destructive. So if we could come up with a method that could do a lot of what the surveys do, uh, but without these um, handicaps, uh, that could be great, right? So one of the methods that comes to our minds is the study of eDNA. So we have applied this. So we have collected samples from the Bay of Biscay. This is just one year of samples. We have been doing it since uh, 2017. So we have collected samples, uh, eDNA samples, and uh, together with um, trolling samples. So basically we have collected two liters of water. We have filtered the water, extracted genomic DNA, amplify with uh, fish specific primers and sequence. And as you can see here, the number of species uh, that we find with eDNA is much, much higher. You can see here this plus 83 more. Uh, but most common species in both methods uh, are, are actually, the most abundant species in both methods are common, which is good news. There are some species that are not detected with eDNA and we have some explanations for some. Some are not in the reference database and so on. And also we find some kind of relationship between the abundance uh, with the catches and the number of DNA copies. What was most interesting from this study is that we actually find a spatial uh, distribution of eDNA uh, that correlates with uh, where we know the species inhabit. So we, we can see that the species from deep waters, the species that live in deeper waters increase as we move far from the coast and species that are more coastal, their DNA decrease as we move far from the coast. So this means that the DNA is not totally mixed in the ocean. And actually we can extract some ecological patterns from the eDNA uh, in the ocean. And this is also shown in this other study uh, that this is part of the European project summer uh, where uh, we actually want to explore the dark ocean. Why? Um, it has been shown that the dark ocean could be a new opportunity as new sources of food for human consumption or aquaculture and new sources of compounds. Um, there is the, some studies that suggest that there could be uh, the biggest biomass of fish on earth is actually located in the deep ocean. So the deep ocean has a key role in trophic connectivity and carbon sequestration. So it is very important that we understand it before we start exploiting them, right? And why is the deep ocean so important? Because, um, partly because of mesopelagic organisms, which are those that perform this dial vertical migration. So they are located in um, shallow waters during the night, they go deep during the day, they go up during the night again. So they go deep to avoid predation, they go up to feed. So they really contribute to this trophic connectivity and this carbon sequestration. And it's very important that we understand them before we start exploiting them. So we apply eDNA to understand this ecosystem. So we sampled again in the Bay of Biscay in different points, and we sampled in vertical profiles. So we went from the surface uh, up to more than 1000 meter depths. So we found about 40% of deep sea fish in overall, so taking all the samples overall. Um, well, the most abundant species is the European anchovy. This survey was done during the European anchovy spawning season, so it was expected. And uh, there were two very, very abundant uh, deep sea fish, uh, which were the white angler fish that you know about now, and uh, Maurolicus mulleri, which is the Muller's pearl site. What is interesting is that both the abundance and the richness of the deep sea fish increase as we go deeper. So the DNA is not totally mixed, there is a stratification. But what is more, even more interesting is that this stratification is different during the day and during the night. So during the day, we see that most of them are uh, in the deeper waters, 
But we can really see this pattern where some of them move up uh, during the night to feed. So we can really see an increase here of abundance of deep sea fish during the night, which was amazing for us to see. We were not expecting to see a so clear signal. This was overall, but if we check species per species, we uh, also see uh, these patterns. So if you see, for example, Morulicus mulleri and Ventosema glaciale are two species that are known to do this vertical migration. So we see this peak during the night. And then we have other species that are only deep sea and they don't go up and we only see them in the deep sea. So basically eDNA can provide information about uh, the behavior of the species. Okay, so this is a good timing because I see Astrid appearing and this is my last slide. Uh, so take home messages, um, genetic approaches are changing how we can assess marine environments, that's clear. They represent cost-effective alternatives for obtaining traditional information, but they also allow to obtain new information and also to reveal hidden information that we were not expecting and that we were, look, we were not looking for. There is a challenge though, and the integration of genetic approaches into the management process requires education. So we really need to communicate this to the managers, to the stakeholders. We need to be consistent. We are criticized a lot because we change methods, we change approaches, so we really need to be consistent somehow. And really, we need to insist, right? We need to, we don't, we shouldn't pretend that we give a talk and then they just um, uptake the method already. So we really need to insist. And finally, yeah, we'd like to thank uh, my team, uh, the funding agencies and many collaborators that they cannot put uh, here. There are many uh, and you for listening and I'm happy to answer any question if I can. <laughs>